this form of a parasite here in India or even where we have a reservoir. There are many other types of lechmavids. Most of them have animal reservoirs and most of them cause containment reptiles. But uh, in, in terms of India, uh, L. Donna Brown is really, is really the major problem. So, so uh, this is a major target for, for new drug development and new vaccine targets. Uh, one of the advantages with Lechmania is that it has a climaxable form here, and these grow beautifully in culture. So this is, I think, the parasite that's easiest to work with because you can grow these things so well in culture and you can geneticically manipulate them for much further development. So um, several years ago, uh, Dr. Zhang in my lab, when we ran it, we developed this, this is a plasma structure, and he developed this so that it could express both the guide RNA and the cat at the same time within the same plasma. And then you could transfect that plasma into the Lechmania parasite. And, the, and so it expressed the guide RNA and the cat, and the guide RNA will interact specifically with whatever sequence you put into the guide sequence and interact with the DNA within the genome. So you could target this to anywhere that's in the genome. Let's say it has 3,000 genes, you could target any one of the genes using the guide RNA. It also expressed the Cas gene. Cas is a nuclease, so wherever the guide RNA binds, the Cas will cut the DNA. Uh, so you could scan the genome, cut the DNA, and now you've cut the chromatin. When you cut the DNA, you're cutting the chromatin. So now what happens when you cut DNA in Lechmania? What happens when you cut a chromatin? Well, two things. Either it repairs that cut and it can go on to survive, or it doesn't repair it and it dies. So it has to repair it, otherwise the parasite will run out. So what's known about eukaryotic DNA repair is basically summarized here. Whenever you cut a genome, there's two major mechanisms for changing the genome and repairing it. The first one is non-homologous engineering. And that's when you cut here and this attaches the genome back together. And when it does it, it makes either deletes or makes redundant. Lechmania doesn't have this, in evolution wise, it's never had it in its fossils. What Lechmania uses is the other mechanism, and that's when you cut the genome, it uses the other chromosome, so Lechmania is a diplogenome, and it uses this as a, as a uh, template to repair the cut as shown here. Is this one working better? Okay. So. Uh, Yes. So it's now repaired the genome using this, this mechanism here. But we wanted to, to test this, and so we put in the CRISPR system into Lechmania, and the gene that we targeted was the Meltifosin transporter gene. Meltifosin is a drug developed largely by Simon and to treat Leishmaniasis. It's a very important drug, but you can get resistant to it if you mutate the transporter. The transporter transports the Meltifosin from the outside inside. So if you mutate it, it can no longer transport the drug inside uh, and it becomes resistant to meltifosin. So we targeted the meltifosin gene here. We, we, we targeted a guide RNA to cut the meltifosin transporter gene um, and we put it into Leishmania and we got resistant cells. So we, it was important to determine why they're resistant and this is where the really interesting result came in. When we sequenced several of the clones, we found that everywhere there was a clone that survived, there was a duplication here. There was a, 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 a homologous sequence on each side of the cut here. So this is where it cut. There's a homologous sequence here and here, here and here, here and here. So in other words, what the parasite did, it looked for homologous sequences and it used those to prepare the chromosome. So it was using sequences from the same chromosome, not the template chromosome. So that was an important result because it allowed you to do something very interesting. Uh, oh, and then, so that shows that this is the mechanism of repair in Leishmania. It uses microhomology end joining. It looks for homologous sequences within the same chromosome and uses that to repair the chromosome. So now when you cut the DNA, it attaches the chromosome to homologous sequences. Now, instead of having to look for these sequences to repair, uh, one of the things you can do is you can add in a sequence. So we call that a donor sequence. And this is really what allows the power of CRISPR in Leishmania 
So when you cut now the chromosome with the CAS, the CRISPR-Cas system, you cut the chromosome, so this is cut. Now what you can do is add into the parasite a donor sequence. And within the donor sequence, you have 25 base pairs homology on each side. So instead of it having to look along the chromosome, you give it something to, to fit in there. So it's like adding a patch to the, um, adding a patch to repair that, that cut. So you add this donor here, it's got 25 base nucleotides on each side, and it repairs the chromosome. Now within the donor, you could add whatever you want. You could add a, a nucleotide change, you could add an antibiotic resistance gene, you could add a, a green fluorescent protein. So this allows you to put whatever you want into the genome in a way that really wasn't possible before. So a few examples. Um, one of the things you can do is you can determine whether a gene is essential or non-essential. And in this case, uh, we try to knock out this RAD51 gene. RAD51 is involved in DNA repair, and it's essential. If you r remove that gene, the parasite won't survive. So this is potentially a good drug target. So again, if you take the guide RNA and you cut one, one of the chromosomes, so Leishmania is diploid, so you cut the chromosome and you give it this donor. The donor has 50 nucleotides on each side. You can easily slight, put that donor into the cut. But if you cut the other, other copy, the parasite will die. So it has to have at least one copy of the gene, otherwise the parasite will die. And you can follow that by PCR. So this is the, 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 the internal non-cut fragment. This is the cut fragment with the, inserted with the um, antibiotic resistance gene here. And you see it's larger. But as you, as you lose one copy, you can see that the parasite is starting to struggle. And as you lose both copies of the gene, you see the parasite is dying. You can actually see the parasite dying in culture when you're cutting both copies. And you can actually follow that day by day. As, as the CRISPR-Cas system keeps attacking that gene, eventually it, the parasite loses both of those genes, and eventually the parasite dies. So this is one way of showing a, 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 a gene is, is essential, potentially a drug target. Uh, the other thing you can do is this is, a, a, again, a donor sequence. You cut the chromosome. This was a miltiposin transporter. You can add this sequence to the gene, transfect it in, and you can integrate within it stop codons. So that would, that would stop the expression of the protein. Or you could change a nucleotide. So you can change one amino acid for another amino acid as well. So you could do even point mutations within the genome uh, using this approach. Uh, this is another example where you can cut the chromosome, again, using this patch uh, with, with 25 nucleotides on each side. You could integrate a gene, in this case, the GFT gene, and you could integrate it exactly where you want it within the genome. Uh, and you can see you can select uh, through fax analysis those parasites that have integrated the, uh, uh, the GFT gene. So, um, so I'll turn now to how we could use this to develop a vaccine. Um, one of the ways of developing a vaccine is to use a live attenuated strain. And to do that, uh, there's been quite a lot of work done in Kira Nakasi's lab at the FDA, where he has deleted a gene called the Centrin gene. Uh, and those parasites are still alive, uh, but when he immunizes with those parasites, he gets protective immunity. And I should point out that the beauty of the Leishmania vaccine system is, is that if somebody is, has Leishmaniasis and they're treated, they're immune for life. So you only get the disease once, but not again, because you develop protective immunity. And this is something that's quite unique in parasitic infections. So th and this also uh, speaks to the fact that developing a vaccine for leishmaniasis really is feasible, because protective immunity can be developed and does exist. So uh, Kira was able to develop these attenuated parasites, but the way he did it was to um, replace the centrin gene with antibiotic resistant genes, pleomycin and hygromycin. And that was the only way he could do it at the time. But you could not advance this parasite to human trials because you can't inject people with uh, parasites that have uh, antibiotic resistant genes as shown here. So uh, we started a collaboration where we, we went to remove this centrin gene here instead of by replacing with antibiotic resistant gene by using CRISPR-Cas and uh, 
in this way, we, there was no antibiotic resistant gene in the parasite, and this could be advanced to human trials if we were able to generate these parasites. So uh, again, uh, when we, Zhang in, in my laboratory, he developed this plasmid vector here, which had two guide RNAs and the Cas genes. And so when you introduce this into Lechmania, one guide RNA was directed to the five prime end of the centrin gene, this guide RNA to the three prime end, and you could cut the chromosome here, cut the chromosome here. This centrin gene, which is a virulence gene, could be removed. But now you had to repair the chromosome. Uh, so again, this donor DNA is added. It's 50 nucleotides. I, I call it a patch because what this does is it just patches together this end with this end exactly the way you want to do it. It's not a random uh, repair. It's a very, very specific repair, nucleotide by nucleotide. You can repair that, uh, that, that cut within the chromosome. And you sequence across it to actually verify that you've, you've actually stitched this part with this part and you remove this part. So, uh, so what was done is, is this is the centrin gene. Uh, this is one of the guide RNAs. This is the other guide. So just this part of the genome is re removed. So let's say one or 2,000 base pairs is removed out of the whole genome, which is uh, eight megabases long. Uh, it was important to, but we wanted to see how specific this was. So you, 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 you design a system to remove a single gene, but in fact, did, did you actually just remove that gene or did anything else happen within the, the, the genome? Uh, so first of all, we sequenced across the centrin gene here. So this is a DNA, this is the depth of the sequence here. So just doing uh, sequencing across, uh, and you can see that this, this is red line here is the centrin gene and it's lost. So there's no reads across this region of the centrin gene. Uh, so, so the gene is lost, and it's also, if you do a southern blot, you can see that the gene is lost. But we also sequenced the whole genome. There's 36 chromosomes, 8,000 genes, uh, and this blue line here represents 8,000 blue dots. Every blue dot is a separate gene. So starting from chromosome 1 to chromosome 36, and you have 100% coverage for all of the genes within the genome except for one, and that one gene was the centrin gene down here. There's no coverage of that gene because that gene was specifically deleted. So, um, just to, to, to briefly go through some, there, there's been a lot of uh, experiments to look at the immunology of this, which I won't go into the immunology, but just to show you one experiment with protection where this was a, a, a C57 black mouse where, um, where the, the live attenuated strain, and in this case we're using a live attenuated Leishmania major, was injected into the ear, um, uh, uh, intradermally within the ear, and then seven, seven weeks following, the, the mouse was then challenged with infected sand flies. This is, isn't a needle challenge, it's a, a sand fly infection challenge, which is more difficult to protect against than a needle, and the sand fly bit on the other ear. So you immunize in one ear, and the sand fly challenges on the other ear. Uh, and 17 weeks later, uh, following that, you can see that uh, in a naive mouse, this is what the ear would look like in the, in the histology here. This was the immunized, and you could see that there was some swelling uh, uh, in the, in where the sand flies had bit, but really it looked much closer to, to, to the naive ear. And in a non-immunized, we had uh, very large lesions occurring here as well. And you could, you could see both the swelling of the ear and also looking at the number of parasites within the ear or within the draining lymph nodes here. This is a log scale here. And so there really is a, a significant reduction in the number of parasites. We also see, although this is a, a, an attenuated L major, um, it also protects against L Donovani in the hamster model as well. And now we're doing trials in uh, Tunisia in dogs using L major using this attenuated L major strain. So this is a, a, a slide of a collaboration we have with a company in Pune, uh, Genova, who is uh, now starting to produce this in, at large scale. So they can, we can start with the frozen stock, grow it up into uh, uh, flasks, 
and then into these bioreactors here. And the bioreactors, this is a one liter, but we can also go on up into five liters now. And this could be grown under GLP conditions and subsequently under GMP conditions. Uh, so we're now in the process. Uh, we've just recently got additional funding to make a GMP product uh, to do toxicology and also for filing for IND for uh, clinical trials, phase one clinical trials, both in the United States uh, and, and in India as well. So these are, are, are is the direction of this uh, project. And so uh, I'll just summarize uh, what, what, the, what, I, what I presented. Um, and that the, the CRISPR system is really an incredible way of, of modifying the genome for Leishmania in ways that we have not been able to do it uh, before. Uh, you can do quite a lot with it. I didn't mention, I didn't show you the data here, but you can actually delete large gene families, and that wasn't possible. Or even chromosome 31, where there's four, four copies, you can delete um, genes, multi-family multi, multi genes within the genome, which wasn't possible before. And you could use this now to identify potential drug targets and for the development of attenuated strains, uh, which could then, uh, since they don't have the antibiotic-resistant markers, you can, they can be advanced into human trials. And I'd just like to, to finish by saying one, one last thing about the vaccine. We say there's never been a vaccine for Leishmania. Well, in fact, that's not true. Uh, there is a vaccine for Leishmania. It's called Leishmanization. Uh, and that's, it's been used in, in a number of countries in the Middle East where you're given L major infection on the skin, a small amount of, on the skin, and it heals, uh, and that person is immune for life. So that, that is a vaccine that has worked. Uh, it is no longer used because of the fact that it causes a lesion on the skin. But w what we're calling this now is the second generation leishmanization because it works exactly the way the first generation leishmanization works, but it doesn't cause the lesion but it still gives you the same protective immune response. Uh, so we're calling this uh, the second generation of leishmanization, and potentially uh, this could also be as effective as the first generation leishmanization. So with that, uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's uh, one of the recent technology can be applied. Any reflection, please? Very nice talk. So I have two questions. As you said, uh, this vaccine, attenuated one, you are making, it will be, the root will be skin. Yes. Uh, so how, because it also multiplies for some time, your attenuated one, so it will also create lesion. Yeah, so, so. So how are you going so to So it, it will be injected intradermally. Yeah. Uh, and it stays in the skin for several months. Yes. Um, and it, uh, during that time, the, it, it develops the immune response, yeah. uh, which, which is subsequent. So it will not create lesion? That it doesn't part? cause, yeah, okay. yeah. It doesn't actually cause a lesion, no. Yeah, oh, so it will just stay, but not it cause? It just stays okay. in the skin without causing yeah. the lesion. So my second question is on technology. Do you also have the conditional knockout system using CRISPR in Eldonavani or, or any uh, lesion? Yes, yeah. yeah, it also works in Eldonavani. It also works in El Mexicana. And conditional and actually also? Works better, better in Donovani than in major. So. Okay, and you can make it conditional also? Uh, conditional, you mean? Meaning, uh, I don't want to completely knock it out. I want to knock it out conditionally, like using some recombinase yeah. or something, when uh, we, I want. We, we haven't Because done some that. essential genes, I don't yeah, think yeah. we can. Yeah, yeah. We haven't developed a conditional system, but I think it probably can be done. Can be done? Yeah. The next question there, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, this may be a silly question, but uh, about 15 years ago, we published an inhibitor of RAD51 uh, for cancer. Yeah. It's never really been taken through, but it was quite effective. I know there are several forms of RAD51 in Leishmania. I just wonder whether it would be any useful in your program. Yeah, it would be interesting to have a look at it. I mean, it, it's, it's interesting that you have, a, have an yeah. inhibitor. Our, 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 the reason we targeted RAD51 was we were trying to 
block the homologous recombination repair pathway so that it would force it to do more into the microhomology and repair pathway. We were trying to engineer it so that it would, because it still has the homologous repair pathway, in which case if it uses that pathway, you, you won't see any of the mutations because that's, that's a, an exact repair pathway. So we were trying to push it. But if you have an inhibitor of that, that, that could be very interesting to look at. We can talk about it later. <laughs> thank you. So thank you, Dr. Grant. That's a wonderful lecture. And by this, we come to the end of this technical session, parasitology. In this session, the four persons has uh, given the lecture, Dr. Wilson, Dr. Sailaja, Dr. Anjana, and Dr. Gregg. Congratulations to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, sir. May I request Professor Samuel Raj to present the memento to Dr. Wilson Aruni and Dr. Shalaja Singh, please. Thank you, sir. Now, may I request Dr. Moses and Baraj to present the memento to Dr. Anjana Mukherjee. Thank you, sir. Now we are going to start with the invited talk session, nanoparticle for diagnosis and drug delivery, please. 